Welcome all and good morning. Uh, welcome to the second in a series of AGIF sustainability webinars. Uh, in the coming months, every week, we'll be delivering webinars on turf and club management with industry leaders to supply career building information to professionals in Asia. A little overview on the AGIF. The Asian Golf Industry Federation is a not-for-profit membership federation comprised of suppliers and facilities in the turf, club, and sports industry. Uh, the Federation focuses on building sustainable practices in both environmental and economic aspects throughout the Asia Pacific region. We believe strongly in the development and the key in development of a sustainable industry is the education and empowerment of professionals in the industry. Hence is why we're running webinars like this one. As a result, in 2018, we initiated the AGIF Certificate in Greenskeeping, which is supported by VRNA and five AGIF member organizations. The CIG focuses on developing the skill set of greenkeepers, turf professionals throughout Asia. Uh, if you're interested, there's more information on our website to register. We're starting a new intake in November. We also focus on club management education and partnership with Club Management Association of America. We have rolled out education in Asia for the pathway to the certified club manager degree. The CCM is considered the gold standard in club management industry and globally and managers in Asia can now achieve the necessary education here in Asia as a result of the partnership with CMAA. It is vital to have strong partners in implementation of education throughout the various markets, and we are honored to have the support of many national and international golf associations, PGAs, turf management, and club management associations. Our education is recognized for credits by the PGA of America, the PGA of GB in Ireland, the PGA of Australia, the PGA of Japan, uh, Club Management Association of America, and the GCSAA. Over the last few months, we have spent a lot of time improving our digital offering and membership benefits. For more information, please log, to, log on to www.agif Asia, as well as our LinkedIn and Facebook company pages. Please also sign up for our weekly newsletter to join the 10,000 industry professionals who are receiving our weekly industry reports. Lastly, uh, the AGIF is a non-for-profit federation, and now more than ever, we rely upon membership dues to operate. So if you like what we do, and or you think that your facility or company will benefit from communicating with the industry, please that our, note that our membership benefits are substantial and can be seen on the website under AGIF membership benefits. You can join as a facility, an individual, or as an industry partner. Please take a look. And if you're already an AGIF member, Thank you so much. Your ongoing support is greatly appreciated. We'd also like to thank the sponsor for today's webinars. Without their support, we would not be able to run these events. The sponsors are Atlas Turf International, Syngenta, and the Toro Company. All three are founding members of the AJF and long-term supporters, so thank you very much. On to some housecoop, housekeeping issues. Um, Dr. Gustoa will present on the topic for roughly 60 minutes and we'll have 30 to 60 minutes after that for Q&A. The chat buttons are on throughout, so please feel free to ask questions, which we can then voice to Dr. Rock during the Q&A. There's also a survey available during the session and we'd appreciate your providing your input. There will also be a link to sign up for the AGI of mailing list. Please fill this in at your convenience to receive more information from the AGIF. AGI. So now on to the main event and to introduce our speaker, Dr. Rock Guswa is the professor and extension specialist in the Department of Agronomy and Horticulture at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. He received his BS and MS in agronomy from New Mexico State University and PhD in crop and soil science from Michigan State University. Studies have concentrated on weed science and engineering soils, engineered soils. Doc Rock has conducted academic research and, re and research as a turf extension specialist for more than 25 years. He has published 96 scientific papers, seven book chapters, over 150 trade journal articles, and is the co-inventor of on four plant patents. He is a frequently invited speaker to conferences nationally and internationally. Doc, the doctor has received Outstanding Young Scientist Award from the University of Nebraska the Distinguished Service Award from the Nebraska Turf Grass Association and the Golf Course Superintendents Association of America, Colonel John Morley Distinguished Service Award. He is the past president of the Crop Science Society of America, 
scientific society uh, of the majority of the U.S. and international turf scientists. He has also been elected as fellow in both Crop Science Society of America and the Agronomy Society, the highest individual recognition in both societies. We're indeed fortunate to have you, Doctor. Welcome. Thank you, Eric. Appreciate it, and thanks for the uh, introduction. I hope that wasn't a little bit too much for some of the participants, but I, I look forward to this. I want to thank uh, primarily Bruce Williams, who's a member of your board, I believe, and um, he suggested me, and I, I, I welcome the opportunity. Um, if I look like I'm nodding off, I'm not. It's just that it's late in Nebraska as opposed to morning over there, and I couldn't do any coffee. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and get started. So I'm going to share my screen, and um, we'll get started. Great. Okay, so... Um, this is, I was, I, you know, I'm talking about these QR codes and none of you can see them. Um, so this one, again, you can use your cell phone and call that up and then you can email it to yourself. I'll use QR codes and websites throughout the presentation. So once again, you can come back to it. Um, as I mentioned in the chat, there's this right here, uh, this web address right here, this URL is, will take you to this presentation. You'll see it right at the top of the page. Um, I transpose these, but anyway, that's under the 2020 presentations, and you can click on that and download it at your, at your leisure. Okay, so let's, let's get into the meat and potatoes of this, uh, of this presentation. Um, we know, we know that golf courses accumulate organic matter, and the interesting thing is, is it took us a while to figure this out, and myself and others Jim Murphy at Rutgers and others that have done a fair amount of work in organic matter management. Um, and then Michael Woods at the, uh, um, in, in Thailand, but, um, and we'll mention him and Jim Murphy a little bit later, but you know, we know here's the original root zone. It doesn't matter whether it's built out of pure sand or built out of an 80-20 surface. It doesn't really matter what's on the surface. It could be a warm season grass like Bermuda or Zoasia, or it could be a cool season grass like, um, creeping bent grass or keeping creeping bent grass and annual bluegrass. So at the end of the day, they all essentially behave the same way in that they accumulate organic matter in what we call for this presentation, the mat layer. Now the mat layer is basically a combination of top dressing sand and the organic residue left behind by the plant as it grows and it dies um, over time. But once again, regardless of the modified root zone. And this isn't true of native soils unless they tend to be sandier. But we don't really see this kind of accumulation, but um, they, they both accumulate roughly at about the same rate. Um, and that just shows you that that's a function of top dressing. And we'll mention top dressing a considerable amount during the next hour or so, um, simply because it's such a fundamental practice in the process of managing organic matter accumulation on the surface of a putting surface. So there's fundamentally two things that you need to do um, to manage organic matter. Um, and we want to change it from a thatch, which is a real hydrophobic, um, great to harbor for insects and diseases, et cetera, into a mat, which is that combination of mineral matter and organic matter. So top dressing, number one, and then two is cultivation. We use cultivation for a number of reasons um, that are not related to organic matter management, but nonetheless, that if this is the way we get sand into the profile. And certainly that sounds rudimentary and fundamental and hey, we can fix this problem because we just have to throw sand and punch holes. But it's really a little bit more complicated than that. And we'll get into this uh, discussion on work we've done over the last 15 years and then share some of the results from others. So I got to tell you a little bit about my journey and it's been going on for almost 20 years now. Um, back in the early 90s, I was funded by the the United States Golf Association and the Environmental Institute for Golf, which is the funding branch of the Golf Course Superintendents Association of America. And over the course of that first decade of doing this work, I talked to a lot of people that were observing things that they were seeing or I was sharing with them and they were saying, hey, maybe this, maybe we have to look at this a little bit different way. So I'll mention these people individually, but they were really instrumental in, in steering us in the direction we did, and I'll mention at the end, but um, we've had a great funding and, and, and resource support from the, from the organizations we described, plus the um, Nebraska, South Dakota, um, and the Peaks and Prairies Golf Course Superintendents Association 
And then the industry threw in a fair amount of support via equipment and other things to do this. And then finally, the golf course superintendents we worked with or had conversations with were really good about providing information um, to help the studies progress over the last um, two decades. And I've been on the road giving presentations like this. Some of you may have seen me present at the um, golf course superintendent show in the States or up in Canada. I've spoken there a couple of times as well. So you might have seen some of this information, but um, I'm open for most of you. It's kind of a new experience. So let's start with what started it all. And this is was the um, early 10 year study on what happens to a golf green as it ages, right? Because we were seeing trends with, with sand-based root zones, specifically USGA structured root zones or engineered root zones, where, you know, it seemed like a fair amount of them started to fail, um, you know, at, at about the 15 to 20 year mark. And there was really no reasonable explanation as to why um, at, at that point in time when we were doing this work. And failure is probably a pretty harsh word, but there were you know, it could have been management, it could have been a number of things, but for the most part, it was simply some of the routine practices that we were doing. And I think that'll become obvious as we work through this presentation. So I, I don't like to spend too much time in just an hour to talk about it, but I think it's important you understand that we, what we did. We, we started with two root zone mixes or engineered soils as they're called, an 80-20 sand peat, and then in 1855, which was a sand peat and a locally available soil in, in Nebraska. And at this point in time, um, peat moss or any organic source was becoming extremely expensive in the States because of a very high demand for new golf courses. Remember, this was in the 90s. Um, we also looked at two growing procedures, one where we just tried to get the green ready for play as quickly as possible, and another where we tried to back off the the accelerated a little bit with about half the inputs to have a more agronomically sound um, grower. And we did this from 1996 uh, till 2000 and then we got picked up uh, another four years of funding from the USGA to finish it out. But we took a lot of data on this and we're not going to belabor the data here, but basically we constructed new greens every year um, for four years with all this treatment, all these treatments on them. And then the last four years, we collected additional data. So we had, when you think about it, we ended up with a green in 2009. And once again, I know that's a few years ago, um, 11 to be exact. But in 2009, we had greens that were nine, but in here, in this box, you would have all those treatments, the different root zones and the different grow-ins. Then we had a green that was 10, 12, uh, whoop, that would be 11 and 12 years old. Um, so at the end of the day, we had this great opportunity to do some long-term investigations into what happens with the green as it ages. And one of the first thing we noticed is if we look at the green age in years on the bottom here, and we look at the infiltration rate, you know, how quickly water gets into um, the root zone. And once again, we'll show you the 80-20 is the uh, red line and the black line is the 80-15-5. The original idea was is that the addition of soil to the profile would um, impair the flow of water in the green as it ages. But what we found out is that when we get into the ninth or tenth year, these lines converge and there's actually no difference. And after about 10 years, um, we see that the green stabilizes at about, this is five inches per hour or about 12 centimeters per hour, which is a pretty good infiltration rate. But when you consider we started um, somewhere in the 60 to 68 centimeters per hour range uh, um, or 15 to 20 inches per hour, you can start to see that obviously we lost infiltration over time. Some of that could be explained obviously by the settling of the sand, but at the same time, we don't expect that much settling over time. And others have figured this out as well, Nick Christians at Iowa State, et cetera. Um, but we see that organic matter accumulates. We go from one year, two year, three year, four year, all the way up to eight years, kind of going in a serpentine pattern. And you, when you start out, you've got this little bit at a year, a little bit of organic matter on the surface. And then each time, each year, this gap gets bigger and bigger till finally, at about eight years, excuse me, thought I was gonna sneeze. At about eight years, you're about three inches of accumulated mat, which is a combination of organic and um, sand, and this is primarily the top dressing layer. 
So you've added three inches. Um, there's been some settling. So you, the green isn't all of a sudden 12. Um, the root zone isn't 12 to 15 inches. It, but there is a little bit of accumulation. And some of you have seen it from your top dressing practice where you alter the topography of the green. But nonetheless, you see this organic matter accumulation over time. So this is what we found out that you, uh, it's about 0.65 centimeters or a third of an inch um, annually following the establishment year. Um, because we were pretty um, dedicated in our top dressing program, um, light frequent every 10 to 14 days and combined with verticutting and then heavy infrequent two times annually in the spring and the fall um, combined with corification, which was equated to about oh, 23 to 24 um, uh, cubic uh, feet of top dressing per on an annual basis. And there was no visible layering, which is a good thing. But once again, we, in a research environment, we have the capacity to do things that you may not be able to do on a golf course. And then in 2004, Paul Rieke, one of my mentors and one of my instructors, oh, sorry about that, one of my mentors at um, Michigan State when I was going to school there, um, he said, so what happened to the original root zone? And I'm going, well, you know, I'm not sure what you're asking, Dr. Rieke. And he said, well, you know, think about it. You stacked three inches of sand on the surface of the original root zone. But did the original root zone fail? If you remember, we started this work early on to see why some of these USG greens, USGA greens were failing. And one of the metrics for failure is loss of infiltration. He goes, but I think it's your top three inches that are causing the problems. It's that top dressing layer. And sure enough, when we tested the root zone, we found that the that there was a difference in particle size between the that that new three inches on the surface and the original root zone, um, with more fines in the uh, finer materials, finer sands in the in the top three inches. And clearly, this was a result of top dressing, right? So we originally thought the top that the organic matter accumulation at the surface was causing the loss in infiltration. But in fact, the saturated hydraulic conductivity or infiltration over time may be due to organic matter accumulation, um, but it could also be the increased fine sand content originally from the top dressing sand. Now, th there's not a fix for this. And once again, we were still uh, taking water at um, about five inches per hour on these greens. But we do know that uh, there were some fines that we put into place when we started using a finer sand percentage in the top dressing sand. But we, there's nothing we could really do because to run that through a sieve at a, at a, at a uh, quarry would have required a cost prohibitive increase in cost. So it was just a fact of life that we were gonna have some loss in infiltration, but for years people were blaming it on the organic matter when in fact it could have been a combination of both all of the above. So I covered that, you know, basically 15 years worth of work really quickly. Um, here's a QR code as well as uh, a reference um, in a golf course management article that we did on soil physical and chemical characteristics of aging golf greens. I think that that has um, some merit for you to take a closer look at if you're so inclined. But that led us into these organic matter studies that we're going to talk now. Um, one of the first ones we were going to do is that you know, there was a tendency to punch holes with a core aerifier, and there was a few of us that were thinking that in a sand-based root zone, is it really necessary to take a core? And so we started wanting to know if hollow tine is more effective than solid tine, and then also some of the newer venting methods that were out there, and whether they had any impact on organic matter accumulation at the surface. Um, so this was the treatment setup. Uh, we had tine treatments where we did, did no tine treatment, two times a year hollow tine. These were half inch um, hollow tines and then two times a year solid tines. This would be half inch OD, outside diameter and half inch inside diameter tines. And then all of these venting treatments, none at all, the use of a device called a Planet Air, the uh, now um, no longer available Toro Hydroject, bayonet tine and then needle tines. The needle tines were, uh, um, the small um, pencil tines in a quadratine setup on a on a, a Procore, and we had every possible combination. So this is uh, roughly about 180 different treatments. 
what's interesting is that, and this is one of our students did this work. Um, what's interesting, we can summarize this work uh, fairly quickly and with some really interesting, interesting things. But I do want to clarify that all treatments received the same amount of sand on an annual basis. But because of the difference, you know, if we don't pull a core and we don't vent, then obviously we're going to need to um, put the sand on uh, more frequently to get the same amount of sand on an annual basis. And for those of you, I mean, once again, I apologize for the English units, but you know, a cubic foot is about 100 pounds of dry sand, a cubic yard, for those of you that like to use mass as opposed to volume, um, 100 pounds of dry sand is uh, roughly a cubic foot and a cubic yard is about 2,700 pounds, so almost a ton and a half. But the reason we did this, and it was one of the things that took the students and staff a long time to do, uh, we wanted to make sure that we were identifying that it was the cultivation that was causing um, the effect that we observe in the, in the research, rather than um, being confounded by uh, variable sand applications. Um, so we used two different ear grains from that big 15-year uh, trial. Uh, we collected organic matter percent and as well as infiltration. Um, and we didn't really see any differences between green edge except the older green had more organic matter. And we'll explain that a little bit later. That's not what we want to belabor at this point in time. Um, no differences among the venting methods. So no matter what venting method we, you did, including doing nothing at all, that didn't have any effect on organic matter. Um, they, they were they were mutually exclusive of each other. That's what we mean by an interaction. And this is what that data looks like. And this is where it gets interesting. This is after one year on the same plots. Remember that all treatments got the same amount of sand. So when we did nothing at all, the organic matter um, was higher than if we core or solid tine. But the important thing to note here is that coring and solid tines were not different. So our original idea or hypothesis, if you will, was that you can achieve the same amount of organic matter reduction um, by using a solid time as you can with an organic time. Well, let's see, you know, that was only after one year. Let's go into year two. I'm gonna cover these relatively quickly. And basically now everything was the same as it was in year two, year one, but now we've got another year worth of application on it, another year worth of cultivation. But now we got no differences among the different techniques. You know, you do nothing at all and your organic matter is not different than using coring or solid tines. That's a little hard to, if you, if you haven't followed this work or when you think about, well, you pull a core, you're pulling organic matter, how can this be? Or you do nothing at all. Remember, we equilibrated the sand. And so now it becomes fairly obvious um, at least to me after looking at this for a, a lot of time, and maybe not for most of you that are viewing this for the first time, um, but it became fairly obvious that the solid time results in um, a, an equal response when it comes to organic matter than a coring time. So take a quick look at that. When you punch a hole, whether you use a solid time or a hollow time, you open up that surface for air and water movement, and it naturally creates an environment where organic matter grows. And when that organic matter grows and we measure it, it's gonna be ca called organic matter accumulation. So regardless of whether the hole is punched or pulled in a sand environment, the amount of organic production is gonna be the same. I don't have it in this uh, slide set, but we have an elaborate study we did where we showed that after about four to five weeks, um, the amount of organic matter you removed by a coring time is replaced in the hole. So that's sort of what happened there. And um, for, from an academic standpoint, as well as a practical standpoint, it helped us establish the next phase in our research, as well as um, other, uh, answering other questions and creating some questions. So what these, let, let, me, let me make this clear. What these data or do or don't suggest, you know, cultivation when top dressing quantity is equal is insignificant as a means to control organic matter. Our data clearly shows that it's about the same. But a superintendent must use whatever tools you have at your disposal. What do you have in your shop? What can you borrow? What can you rent or lease or whatever? But you got to make sure the sand is getting into the profile and not the mower bucket. So whether that's a bayonet tine or whether that's a quadratine, 
you still have to find a way to make sure the sand gets into the profile. We'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later when we talk about Jim Murphy's work at Rutgers. So for us to be able to do nothing, nor cultivation at all, we were having to put sand on every five to 10 days for our seven month growing season. Not practical, not practical at all. Very small quantities every five to 10 days. If we did just solid and hollow time with no venting technique or practice, uh, we could put sand down every seven to 14 days. Um, if we incorporated a venting practice, then we were able to put sand down every 14 to 18 days. So from a labor standing standpoint, the combination of a tine of some kind, whether solid or hollow, with the venting techniques that we looked at uh, would give you so the widest, the least surface disruption and the widest span between um, top dressing events. Now there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, sand incorporation, you know, the, the, um, that, that we didn't test in our trial, but once again, it's about the sand. Um, another thing we found out once we started recommending solid time is that a lot of the superintendents that were adopting it found out they could get more sand into the profile if they applied the sand before they they put the uh, put the cultivator over it. So basically, they were they're pounding the sand into the profile. The same is not true necessary of core cultivation, but we do know if you want to get sand into the profile, put the sand down first, and then um, run the run the solid time aerator over the top of that sand. This is described better once again in this this website um, and this is actually recommendations that came from superintendents we worked with that said yeah we love using the solid time but we also find we can get the sand into the profile better if we um, put the sand on first. And this there was infiltration in this study and um, the interesting thing here is that uh, we're not talking about this for the for the purposes of organic matter management, but we do see that the needle tine, the gray bar, and the hydrojack, the blue bar, which isn't currently or planned to be available anymore by the Toro company, resulted in an increase in infiltration, regardless of the tine treatment, um, that was equivalent to what the green originally started out with. And even the even the needle tine and the quadratine setup, um, we were somewhere around 15 inches an hour. Remember, we started at about 20. Um, so if you want to recoup some of that infiltration you've lost, um, then, then the use of a, of a needle tine makes a lot of sense. Uh, this, you can read this in, in, um, by hitting this QR code or going to our website. Um, and we have this paper online. And once again, that's a, another opportunity to, you to do some um, nighttime reading or whatever if you're so inclined. The next phase of this research was um, a national survey. And with this national survey, what we were attempting to do was to use modeling, you know, uh, scientific modeling to determine the cause and effect relationship among management practices and their interactions relative to organic matter accumulation. So, so how did we do that? Well, we took samples um, from 16 golf courses in 16 states. Um, there's the list there. I'll show you a map here in a minute. Um, 117 golf courses were sampled, so we had more than 1,600 samples that we took organic matter samples from. On top of that, the superintendents were asked to fill out a fairly comprehensive survey about their management practices. How did they irrigate? How much fertilizer did they use? Did they use plant growth regulator? Um, did they, what kind of cultivation techniques did they use? So we had that data, agronomic data, and then we also took data on you know, latitude and longitude, um, annual precipitation, um, annual temperature extremes, et cetera, et cetera. So we threw this all into this massive model, um, had to use a mainframe computer on our campus because the data set was so large. And, um, you know, when you consider that we looked at, you know, pretty much most of the United States, except for the Southeastern mostly, but the Midwest, um, Central Great Plains, um, the, the arid west and the west coast and east coast, um, but we didn't have much except for Arkansas um, in the southeast. After all that, um, you're going to find that we didn't find out as much as we thought we would. Uh, one of the first things we discovered was that superintendents, um, we asked them to predict what they thought their um, organic matter percentages and 
of all the 16 golf courses and the superintendents, or 16 states, excuse me, and the superintendents that were surveyed, consistently they tended to overestimate how much organic matter they had. Um, the average across all 1600 samples was really close to 3%, a little over 3%. Um, and yet the superintendents tended to estimate their organic matter percentage at something a little over 7%. We thought that was interesting, but was even more interesting. And I don't want you to get bogged down into the diamonds and everything on this graph, but, um, but if you look at what the superintendents predicted, some of them predicted upwards of 25 to 30 percent organic matter when in fact they were down around um, anywhere from one and a half to three and a half percent. So why the disconnect? Why would that be something? And these are superintendents that had not collected organic matter. Well, it's pretty, once we think about it, it's pretty simple. Construction values are based on a volume ratio. So for example, an 80-20 sand organic matter is essentially eight buckets of sand and two buckets of organic matter, whatever the organic source is. And it's thrown into what's called a pug mill and, and blended on, off site and then taken to the golf course and used for construction. But organic matter, when we test it in the lab, is reported as a percent from a lab analysis measured by weight. So a three and a half percent organic matter, which is what the number that some of you see in your lab reports, well, you multiply by that by 10, and this is what the lab measured, 35 grams of organic matter per kilogram of soil. So it, you've got to understand that depend, depending upon how you look at the number, once again, construction values are based on volume and um, analytical values are based on uh, by weight and expressed as a percentage. You can see how superintendents that believe their greens started with 20% organic matter uh, during construction would feel that since they do accumulate organic matter, it would actually be as high as 25 to 30%. Interesting observation and um, of little practical value. We saw a strong relationship between how old a green was. We had greens in the East Coast, in Connecticut and New Jersey that were, um, they'd been top dressed with sand over the last 30 or 40 years. So they were essentially a sand-based root zone, but they had organic matter in the, um, in the you know five six seven percent i mean this one up here which is kind of an outlier but it was uh, over eight percent um and that would have been a green that was about 80 years old um and then a lot more greens in this zone right here right um but greens that are 20 um years old or less tended to have be grouped in the uh in the two to the four percent range And this is where we discovered that maybe we'd made a mistake that we could, that we would have to be able to explain because we took our samples always at a set depth, three inches in our example, okay? So when we look at what that looks like, um, basically, you know, the, when we separate that out by depth, we take it, oops, we take it, the thatch, the first inch or zero to two and a half centimeters, um, next several inches and finally 10 to 20, 20, we find that as we go deeper into the profile, here's the year right here, eight, seven, six, five year old greens, that it's not, it's only in this zone right here where we detect differences, but that's having a strong effect on our final number. That's why currently you'll see people suggesting a different way to sample if you're sampling for organic matter. And we'll talk about that towards the end of this conversation so that you understand that we, Sampling at a set depth is not recommended anymore, simply because it confounds the data and confuses the bottom line. You can see this visually here, but this is a zone where we actually detected differences. And you see what a strong effect the age had on that. Because clearly this is gonna be a lower number of a, on, a, on a younger green, and especially in this um, one to four inch zone, where it's dominated by sand on this end and less so on the eight year end. A lot of differences with states, um, you know, but, but this is primarily an effect of, of oops, sorry, effect of age. You know, the New Jersey and the Connecticut greens had higher organic matter, not because of the conditions, but because of their age. Um, cultivars, we would have thought that there would have been an, an effect of the newer 
uh, more dense bent grasses, but once again, strongly affected by age based on our sampling technique. Just qualifying that sometimes data is not as it appears until you start looking at it. But we did see a strong relationship that the more sand you put on, um, this is tons per thousand square feet, um, the more sand you put on, the less organic matter have. So now here's a second, this survey data from, you know, a lot of samples across most of the United States show that if you put on more sand, you have less organic matter. Seems um, intuitive, but nonetheless, this was data to support that idea. So now we have two studies that indicate that the, t that the amount of sand is critical in managing organic matter. But what we did find is we could put all of this into this, you know, Buck Rogers laser beam model and come up with a um, way to predict how much organic matter you would have based on your management practices. What was consistent is that we know that courses that use greater than 18 cubic feet um, per thousand square feet of top dressing with or without venting had lower organic matter contents. Um, so at the end of the day, it boils down to how much sand you put down. Courses that had less than this on the spectrum had more organic matter. This is also summarized in a paper that's available to you on our website. Use the QR code um, or simply go to our website that was listed in that first link. So did we discover anything really new? Well, um, according to the Herdzan book, Mike Herdzan, uh, the architect, uh, old Tom Morris um, is thought to have discovered the benefits of top dressing when he accidentally spilled a wheelbarrow of sand on a putting green and noted that the sand looked a lot better after that. So that's sort of nothing earth shaking here with top dressing have a positive effect. Um, but what's interesting is that, you know, James Beard in his classic textbook, Turfgrass Science and Culture, which is sort of one of the Bibles in the early days of turf management, um, it says it really simply, the most important management practice for organic matter management is top dressing. So we didn't really discover anything new, but we had noticed a trend towards people looking for a magic bullet when it came to managing organic matter. And we found that it is really back to, back to basics, back to agronomic basics. We started wondering how many people were adopting some of the practices we're describing. Um, and there's a, an, on, there's a app called Greenkeeper. Um, and we, we sent out a survey on Greenkeeper. So thanks to Bill Kreuzer, the inventor of the app, uh, we sent out a um, survey and we got 300 responses back. And we asked a lot of questions and we just said, please mark all that apply. In the last five to 10 years on your greens, um, the facility had done things like increased top dressing quantity, increased top dressing frequency, increased hollow time, increased solid time, blah, 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 on down and on down the list. Um, so let's take a look at that data. And this is just 300 out of um, a lot of superintendents. But nobody, very few had decreased solid, uh, very few had minimized cultivation, and very few had minimized top dressing. Um, a lot had increased hollow, a few had actually decreased hollow, but this was probably in response to the number of superintendents that had increased solid timing. So this sort of showed that our work was being adopted, and we find that more and more, at least in the United States and Canada, that uh, a fair amount of superintendents um, are currently solid tining as opposed to core cultivation. Um, and at the same time, they're putting on more sand more frequently. And then here's the big one. Venting techniques are prevalent in, um, in, in North America now. That, that seems to be the go-to, as well as Europe. I'm not sure about Asia. I haven't traveled to Asia in over five years, so I haven't been able to get a, wrap my arms around what's going on in Asia. Um, but at the end of the day, this venting you know, quadra tining, bayonet tining, um, uh, ninja tining, these, these venting techniques have proven to be very, very effective and adopted by the superintendents. Then Pace Turf, uh, pa uh, Larry Stahl at Pace Turf um, put a survey on Twitter and um, they were asking about on, on Poa Bent Greens and in some areas where he services a uh, um, he does some of his work there, predominantly POA, and sometimes they're, um, but most of the time they're a mix of uh, 
annual bluegrass and, and creeping bent grass. And clearly 74% of the people are gonna punch a hole or pull a core in these poa pent greens. So this, this um, surface disruption idea doesn't seem to be prevalent when you give in the fact of the positive effects of core of uh, punching a hole or, or pulling a core. But what was interesting is that along the coast of California where Dr. Stahl does most of his work, 34% um, of the people were gonna just use solitines. So we've seen a trend towards the adoption of some of the work we've done and positive benefits from that with the conversation from the superintendent. So how do you get rid of organic matter? Um, well, decomposition, you've got to increase surface area and that's what um, aeration does, whether it's a small needle tine, a bayonet tine or whatever, we're talking about increasing surface area and increasing microbial activity. Um, we have done a lot of work with inoculants that purportedly decrease organic matter content and we've had inconsistent results. For the most part, we don't recommend them. Physical removal, um, you know, with power raking, dethatching, corification, and dilution. What, what we're finding is this last one, hence it's less than last, <clears throat> maybe we should list it first, this dilution with top dressing is, is what we should be recommending the most. Um, so the solution to pollution is dilution. If you consider organic matter as dilution, excuse me, as pollution. Um, there's a lot of information out there. Here's one, one study or one survey basically out of golf course industry. And I'm not gonna show you all this data, but uh, it's true grit. There's a QR code. You might wanna look this up and for your, for your bedtime reading, but nonetheless, it has some really good information on it um, about, uh, about top dressing practices in, in at least in North America, current trends. And th this is from 2018. But now I wanna talk about some great work that was done by Jim Murphy at Rutgers. And what we see is when people wanna top dress more frequently, there's a tendency to wanna to go to a finer sand. And Jim, Dr. Murphy and I had talked about this at length and there are some concerns about what the finer sands might ultimately do um, to uh, surface moisture retention and, and surface hardness and a number of other things. Um, he, he shared these slides with me when he spoke at our conference in 2019 in Nebraska. So, you know, there's a lot of data out there about sand particle sizes and the ones that are difficult to incorporate into a dense canopy of either warm season or cool season grasses on the putting green. That would be in the, the very coarse and the coarse sands. Now we know the very coarse and the coarse sands have certain characteristics that are really valuable. But if they're all ending up in the bucket of the mower, how much, how much value do they have? And then we know that for drainage, this is the recommendation for maximum um, drainage based on USGA specification. We wanna see a minimum amount of very fine and fine sand, not more than 20% fine sand, not more than 5% um, very fine sand. And yet we see superintendents going towards these finer sands because they're easy to incorporate. Um, bagged dried sand can be sprayed on the surface in a very light dusting and actually irrigated in without the need for um, uh, and damage, potential damage to the, um, to the mowers. So he had this research objective to see the effects of top dressing on sand lacking coarse particles. So half millimeter or less sand and there's, does core cultivation and backfilling holes with medium coarse sand, i.e. twice a year in New Jersey, have any negative effects um, when you combine that with top dressing that sands that lack coarse particles. Um, so this is sort of the specifications he used in the classification scheme he, he described. And we're going to show you a reference at the end here so you can get this in a more condensed form. Um, here's the treatments, not to belabor them, but he did a lot of work to come up with some really nice conclusions. Um, so after three years, and he just finished the fourth year of this, um, top dressing improved the surface. It reduced the organic matter concentration, not surprising there, and it produced a drier surface. So firm and fast is the goal. A drier surface should be part of that goal. Uh, so what does sand size do on physical properties? The medium fine, so it's greater than 20% uh, fine sand, 
increased the fineness of sand in the mat layer, but did not influence water infiltration or water content at the surface. Medium coarse and medium fine sands were similar. Um, so the, the coarser particles were obviously equal to or, or as good as. The fine medium sand slowed water infiltration and made the surface wetter. So that fine medium sand was, was causing, would cause some issues in, in the concept of going firm and fast on the putting surface. So the fine medium sand substantially increased fine and very fine particles in the mat layer. This is where we think that water retention is coming from. So core cultivation and backfilling, however, with medium coarse sand, very effective at reducing surface wetness and organic matter concentration. And then it reduces the amount of fine and very fine sand in the mat layer. So basically, if you use the coarser materials, the, the uh, medium coarse sands, in combination when you core cultivate or when you solid tine is which I'll say at the end here, um, you can use the finer sands as a routine top dressing practice through the growing season. Um, so that's basically what his data show. So, so managing for a drier mat layer, um, top dressing obviously, select as coarse of sand as feasible. Um, you know, somewhere, somewhere in the medium fine half millimeter sand with less than 30% fine sand. When you core cultivate, um, it's very effective at producing a drier surface. Um, needed if re reducing organic matter is important. Removal plus allows for more sand incorporation. Um, and then time for healing is the greatest limitation, but we know this is less so for venting and the use of solid times. Uh, the black is what Dr. Murphy put in and the uh, red is what I put in. So just keep that in mind. I've added or embellish these um, conclusions a little bit. This is covered really well in an article that was put out in 2019 by um, the director of the USJ research program and one of the, uh, Brian Whitlark, one of the USJ agronomists. And um, this is a combination of not only the work that Jim Murphy did on cool season grasses at golf greens in um, New Jersey, but also on um, uh, golf greens in the southeast that were Bermuda grass. Um, so you get a warm season, cool season approach here that I didn't talk about um, in the previous slide. So there's a couple of instances there where we've provided information because my understanding is that most of you have, um, have warm season greens. So how much sand to use? Well, we've thrown out recommendations of, you know, between 18 and 24 cubic feet per thousand square feet per year. Um, this is this is uh, just a generic recommendation is 20 to 40. That's a big range, 20 to 40 cubic feet. And it varies with a lot of reasons. But what you're trying to do is match your growth rate with your top dressing so that you're not putting on more sand that you need, but you're putting on enough sand. And there are some new tools out there that can be very helpful in doing this. Um, Larry Stahl, once again, at Pace Turf um, has a great um, spreadsheet uh, model for both cool and warm season grasses um, that will that that estimates your top dressing needs on an <clears throat> on on a weekly monthly annual basis um, based primarily on on um, temperature and precipitation. You know, the model's a little more complicated than that. Just recently, he published the warm season one. So this is a good guide. I, I'm not going to say it's absolute. I don't think Dr. Stahl would say that either. It's not absolute, but it gives you a good guide about how much at your particular location, and it should work um, anywhere based on how models are supposed to work. So I'd suggest you take a look at that. Oh, let me back up here. And that's called growth potential. What's the potential for... The, the, the environmental conditions to cause growth in your particular instance. Um, then there's a really nice article that you can further refine measuring growth potential by measuring clipping volume. Um, there's a, a free book that Micah Woods at the Asian Turfgrass Center puts out. You can get it by um, scanning that QR code or go to asianturfgrass.com. It's a PDF that you can download, but it, it's called One Bucket at a Time. Great information really solid approach to um, how to measure clipping volume. And a lot of superintendents, at least in 
the United States, in the North America are reluctant to start measuring clipping volume, but the ones that do swear by it. So you might want to take a look at that and, and then you could further refine your top dressing based on actual growth measurements. So how do you sample? If you're going to take a sample, how do you sample that? What's, what's the most effective way to do that? And unfortunately, these are all the protocols that are out there for labs. And I'm going to say none of them are right anymore. Um, they basically bias depending upon depth and other things. So once again, Michael Woods has come up with a really creative way based on previous work as well as work that he's done um, primarily in, in, um, in and around locations that some of you might be familiar with in Asia. He calls it hashtag organic matter 246, um, putting green organic matter by depth. Um, it, it gives a good rationalization and justification for sampling at two, four, and six centimeters. So from zero to two, um, from two to four, and then from four to six, and sending those samples in. This, um, this link that I've got here will, will, goes into great depth about how to sample and some other things. But nonetheless, we're gonna strongly suggest that you modify your current sampling technique if you're not separating by depth. So what about organic matter testing? Know how your sample was taken and compare notes with others only if they use the same protocol, because there's a lot of different ways to do this. Take annual tests to determine long-term trend based on whatever management you're doing. Always at the same time of year, because we know that if you sample the same green at the same location, um, at least in the central United States, um, you can get different numbers, whether it's you know spring, summer, or fall. Uh, same location in greens, or I recommend all greens that can get cost prohibitive when it comes to sampling. Um, avoid a set sampling depth. That's why I'm, I recommend the organic better 246 that um, Michael, Dr. Michael Woods has developed. And then here's the deal. There really is a, isn't a magic number. If you're trying to target a number, that's probably not the way to do, but correlate your test results with the quality of your surface and performance during not when things are going great, but when the turf is stressed and to determine whether you need to change and modify and whether the organic matter is really causing um, that much problems. Threshold critical levels likely vary across the globe and from course to course. That's what our uh, survey data has shown us. So here's some more over, over oversimplification. One size does not fit all. You're gonna adapt based within the capacity of your location, right? What do you have available to do this? Uh, there is no universal optimal organic matter concentration. There have been reports that, oh, you never want to exceed, you never want to exceed this, but that was all based on solid research, but, but location specific. Um, methodology and sampling differences exist. I think we're getting closer with some of the work uh, others are doing as well as our group and, and Micah Woods. Um, there in, in Thailand. Um, cultivation is critical to increase efficiency in sand incorporation. And solids are not different than coring kinds for the most part. And then there are be other benefits to top dressing besides organic matter management, reduced uh, anthracnose, reduced dollar spot. So top dressing is the, is the target, right? The solution to pollution is dilution. I have one last QR um, code I wanna share with you. This is, an, is a chapter that I wrote with um, several colleagues and, and former students, um, including an international author from Ireland. And we basically put together a very technical, very academic uh, chapter called Characterization, Development and Management of Organic Matter in Turfgrass Systems. Um, you can download that as well. Uh, like I said, it's heavily referenced and very technical, but if you are so inclined you certainly are welcome to download that um, chapter for, for your own use and reading. I do want to finish up with acknowledgments. Um, we wouldn't have even started this work almost 20 years ago um, if we hadn't, um, oh, over 20 years ago, excuse me, if we hadn't received initially funding from the United States Golf Association and the Environmental Institute for Golf, um, also the local superintendents, uh, Nebraska and South Dakota. And then the peaks and prairies, this one right here is basically Montana, 
Wyoming and, and um, parts of Utah. So that group was good at giving us a little bit of funds to do this. The kept companies that helped us out were Jacobson, Toro, uh, JRM, and Planet Air. And then finally, the organization that uh, takes care of our plots on campus financially is the Nebraska Turfgrass Association. So I always like to end with the acknowledgement that this couldn't have been done without financial support and then the support of all the superintendents that contributed great ideas as we've wandered down this um, somewhat circular path on, on organic matter management. Okay, that's all I've got. And um, I think we're gonna be ready to, I'm gonna quit sharing my screen and we can, um, we can answer some questions, Eric. Fantastic, Dr. Rock. I mean, it's uh, condensing all that in from six hours into one. Thank you so much for, uh, for doing that. We wish we had more time and hope to have you out in Asia at some time in the future to get more of your knowledge. We do have quite a few questions, so I'll just sort of uh, launch into it from Anit Mahrotra from India. Anit asks, uh, sends his regards and asks, uh, you said that, the, that we must put dry sand before aeration on the greens. Should we just put dry sand or mix with OM with it before aeration? Oh, that's an interesting question, Anit. So, um, Basically, you want the sand just to be dry. You do not want, or if you're trying to manage organic matter, you, what we call dirty sand, sand that's got organic matter in it, we do not suggest you do that. You should be sand, you should be putting top dressing with, with pure sand of a particle size that makes sense for your operation. All right, so second one is from Joel Cheng, I believe Joel is coming in from Hong Kong from the Kowloon Cricket Club. Welcome, Joel. Is there is other control like promote microbes to break down fats effective instead of mechanically? We've looked at um, we've looked at a lot of different things, you know, products, inoculums, and we haven't really seen any consistency with cool season grasses. There's a fair amount of work that shows some of the cellulase degraders, which are microbial based, do facilitate or accelerate uh, degradation in, in Bermuda grass. Um, so there are some examples in warm season grasses, uh, less so or non-existent in, in the cool season grasses. But we know that the microbes that prefer an aerated environment, you know, more air, also are better at degrading organic matter. So the cultivation practice itself stimulates microbial activity um, but the addition of additional microbes in the cool season environment doesn't seem to work as effectively uh, or make, an, make a difference. But at the, uh, in the warm season environment, there is some limited data that shows these microbial inoculants work. I, I'm hoping that ans answered your question. I may not have heard it correctly. We have a question from Ross Grieve up in, in Hong Kong at Sheko Golf Club. Uh, Dr. Rock, once you start hollow tying pouring of new greens, would you recommend rubbing in the root zone material brought to the surface back down into the pore holes, assuming it is USGA spec root zone? And if so, at what point would you stop this practice once OM levels start to increase? Um, th that's a great question. And we've had that question asked a number of times. Uh, basically, when you, um, you know, when you build a green, you build it out of a usually an 80-20, maybe sometimes pure sand, but mostly it's like an 80-20 or an 85-15, something along those lines. And certainly um, in the first year, there would be value in putting in the same material that you built the green with. But after the year, first year, we see that the organic matter starts to accumulate. And once again, you want to avoid the use of any top dressing material that has organic in it. So if you can use the same specification sand, without organic matter in the second year, that's what we would suggest. So it would be a year with the original greens mix, and then in the second year, go in with a, um, a, a organic matter minus top dressing sand. And if you can stick, if you could stick to the original specification sand that you built the green out of, um, you're gonna see less issues with layering and other things. It's not gonna have much to do with organic matter because that's all about the volume of sand. But at the end of the day, um, you can avoid layering by using the same material. But if you do have to switch, I would do it in, in year two for financial reasons. And that's generally what most of the superintendents um, in North America do. They come in with a, 
less expensive sand in the second, third, and fourth year after green construction. We have another uh, question from Mike McKenna in Thailand at Amasa Spring. Uh, Dr. Rock, any thoughts of, on top dressing before or after aeration? I personally use top dressing first, but interested in your opinion. We, this is an interesting question because I, first I would have thought that was crazy, but more and more people are putting the sand down first and then running the cultivator over it, whatever the cultivator is, and helping push the sand into the profile, which is where the more sand you can get into the profile, the less sand that ends up in, in, your, um, in your mower buckets. And you're paying for this, and you certainly don't want to pitch it into the refuse pile. So at the end of the day, I think cultivation post sand application is, is a trend, and we see very positive results with that. We have another question from Anit in India. Uh, as per your experience, after how many years do greens need to be reconstructed, even if they are maintained with the best cultural practices? Wow, and it, that's a that's an interesting question because I don't know if I don't know if we have a magic number. The it seems that we have we have USJ greens that that have been built and in place and not and have not been rebuilt and they are being being uh, they're in great shape. That are forty years. You know, the USJ specs first came out in the '60s, and you know that's forty fifty years ago, and these greens are still functioning fine. Um, and then we have other greens that are less than five years old that had to be reconstructed because of something that was done during construction or some, you know, they, they went with a different type sand for some reason and that caused some issues or um, they, they had um, something that caused some layering that didn't seem to be able to be rectified with deep tine aeration or any other, you know, heavier sands or anything like that. So I, I don't think there's a, there's no magic number for a percentage nor is there a life of a green. Many people though, that's just my opinion on it. Um, many people um, think that a USGA green almost automatically has to be reconstructed in about 20 to 25 years. I don't believe that to be true. Uh, we have a question from Henry Ng, and that was in, uh, in Kuching in Malaysia. Uh, Dr. Rock? Does introduction of beneficial microbes help in accelerating breakdown of organic matter on the putting surface? I'm sorry, can you, can you repeat that, Eric? I'm sorry. Does introduction of beneficial microbes help in accelerating breakdown of organic matter on putting surfaces? Yeah, I, as I've mentioned previously, we don't see a huge benefit um, with introduction of microbes. Um, but there, there are pro strong proponents of it. Uh, Dan Danelli, a good friend of mine at, um, at, uh, in a, at a golf course in the Chicago, greater Chicagoland area, um, swears by them and sees positive effects. So our data doesn't necessarily support that, um, nor does uh, um, sort of conventional microbial ecology, but every golf course has a different environment. So I'm not gonna dismiss them, simply say that in our experience and our research does not support the introduction of beneficial microbes to degrade organic matter. We have another uh, question from Ross in Hong Kong. What's your thought process on taking core samples for laboratory testing, OM and nutrient testing, remove the top layer of thatch grass from the sample or, in, or, or to include it? Ross has an interesting question as well. These are great questions. Thank you. Thank you all for, for providing them. Um, so when we do so let, let's go back and, and Micah talks about this at length. When we do our sampling, we remove what's called the verdure, which is the living green tissue at the surface. And that's to normalize the sample, right? We don't remove the thatch, you know, we don't remove the mat. And now we've started sampling, like I said, using the, the um, hashtag OM246 methodology that we shared some information on. Some people remove, um, don't remove it. And uh, we're currently doing some work um, I'm co collaborating with others, um, Dr. Murphy, for example, we're currently doing some work or getting ready to do some work. As we say in the West, we're fixing to do some work on, on, um, on do uh, testing exactly that. Does re leaving just the grass on the surface substantially change the organic matter um, measurement? And, and we think most of that grass is probably, you know, predominantly water. And when we look at the 
more lignified materials that below that? Probably not. So uh, I, all I'm going to say is be consistent. If you're comparing numbers from year to year and trying to track what's going on in your system, just always take the sample the same way. And then you know you're comparing apples to apples and not apples to oranges. Or if you decide to change to a different way where you leave it on there, just be prepared to see that it might cause a little bit of an uptick in the organic matter. But I, I'm, I'm convinced that the methodology that's used by soil scientists in agricultural soils isn't the way to do it because they physically remove most of the organic at the surface, which is what we're most concerned about. And this also, um, you know, this whole idea was initially proposed by Dr. Woods. At, and, and you can see that in the article, once again, that I shared. But there is a trend to go towards more aggressive sampling and more precise sampling, but the whole leave it on or take it off is still up for debate. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Vincent Pinto in India. Doctor, can we use stone crushed sand for top dressing, which was made from river sand? Stone crushed sand. So there are areas that are, you use what's available. It, we know that crushed sands tend to be, um, you know, more jagged, you know, they're more angular. And, and, you know, in our area of the country, everything is river wash, so it's very smooth. Well, we know that the angular sands stabilize quicker, but we also know that they can shear roots a little bit. Now, don't get all excited. I'm not going to use it because it'll show roots. But it's, as long as it meets the particle sizes and doesn't have any, uh, you know, very fine silt or clay particles in it, um, crushed rock sand is fine. Uh, another question from Mike uh, in Amata in Thailand. Uh, what, in your opinion, is the point of no return, quote unquote, on OM depth on the putting green, as in a ballpark figure for a redo situation? Does this figure different from warm to cool season greens? So the difference, what we see in the difference between warm and cool season greens is the warm season greens have a greater concentration and more highly lignified material right at the surface because, you know, Bermuda grass mostly, um, it, you know, has rhizomes and stolons. It's highly lignified. Warm season grasses have a higher silica content. So there's a tendency for them to degrade slower. So you get a greater concentration. But in terms, if I'm understanding the question correctly, Eric, it's asking, you know, how, how deep and generally it's going to adhere to the top dressing layer to a point where you know, greens that have been top dressed for 30 years, you don't see root money roots, especially at the mowing heights currently, you don't see many roots um, or you don't see the majority of roots much below four or five inches. And in some cases, no deeper than one or two. So I'm going to say that the limit is more about mowing height and management than it is about um, organic matter accumulation over depth because roots just don't grow where there's no oxygen and even with really good cultivation practices, the amount of oxygen you have down um, at, you know, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 inches um, isn't all that high relative to the surface. I have a question from Sanjay Kukarni. This is Dr. Rock. How much OM is considerable on a green PI you thought? So that's... Sorry, you're breaking up a little bit, Eric. I didn't hear the tail end of that. How much... OM is considerable acceptable on a green and uh, P, uh, please your thoughts on how much OM is considerable on a green. Okay, we, I have stood on greens in Connecticut that had 9% organic matter um, that were US open ready. And I've been on um, greens in, in southern New Mexico that were um, less than 2% organic matter and, and were, were in a world of hurt. So. Um, there's a lot going on, but if, if I have to come up with a number, um, when we start exceeding, you know, three and a half to four inches, the potential, and this is work that Bob Caro did, and I, once again, as I've said multiple times, there is no magic number, but when you start getting into the three and a half to four percent range, um, then you're starting to accumulate probably more organic matter than you want. But if you're doing the separation by depth, those numbers are going to change. If you're taking a bulk sample, um, you know, when you start getting approaching four, four and a half percent, then you're probably looking at the potential for problems versus somewhere around two and a half to three and a half percent. A lot of questions are not stopping. 
It's good stuff. Um, from Ross in Hong Kong again. Uh, have you done any research on heavy verticutting or scarifying versus coring on OM management? Uh, no, we haven't. We basically use a light verticut to get our light frequent top dressing in and then use a venting tine or a, a half inch core or half inch solid tine for the more for the heavier operations that we do on a on a twice a year basis. But no, we we've never done. And I know that in the in in the Bermuda grass belt um, in in the US, they do do some aggressive verticutting. Once again, the majority of my experiences is with cool season grasses. Uh, so I have a question from Isaac, Isaac Luck, uh, Dr. Rock. Uh, for the root zone mix, does turf perform better in a ratio of 80-20 sand to peat or in 80-15-5 sand peat soil ratios? Isaac, that's a great question. And for the first 10 years, the turf in the 80-15-5 consistently looked better. It performed better, the surface was better, it had better color, um, it had better stand density. It, it had a little bit higher um, moisture content at the surface, but not enough that I would be concerned about it. So the addition of that soil did a great job. But then after 10 years, we've got so much top dressing sand on it, uh, it pretty much negates whatever the original root zone. But I will tell you that the sand peat soil was considerably cheaper to um, to blend than an 80-20 um, sand peat mix was because peat moss, uh, you know, it's kind of a finite research and um, the bogs in Canada even are starting to claim that they're starting to lose um, capacity to harvest it. So at the end of the day, um, the addition of the soil had an environmental benefit, but also it decreased the cost considerably. Great question. Isaac. <clears throat> Rock, I think uh, we've got uh, some great questions and uh, I think that's it for now. Um, really like on behalf of AJF and all the viewers of the webinar, I'd like to thank you for your time. Uh, I know it's uh, evening time back in Nebraska, but we very much appreciate your, your expertise. And uh, we hope to see you out here in Asia uh, sooner rather than later. That would be great. I'd look forward to the opportunity. Thank you all for sticking with me. I know it's a early, not early morning, but mid morning for you. Um, it's almost bedtime for me. <laughs> <laughs> all right, to all the uh, registrants, uh, thank you very much for, a type, uh, for, for registering and taking time out of your busy schedule. Keep uh, online for other webinars that we have. We have uh, every Thursday, uh, we have a, a different webinar on turf, turf grass management and club management. So uh, please keep uh, your eyes peeled for that. And um, have a great rest of the week and the weekend. Thank you very much.